So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone here for uh, another presidential colloquium in the series Thinking Out Loud. Uh, this series is really, I would say, the brainchild of uh, Chris Rose, a visiting professor of engineering here, who I'll introduce in a second. And I think what's really exciting about these lectures has been you know, both how they focus on the future, but at the same time to connect to sort of the current things that are going on in a variety of academic disciplines. Uh, and I think that ability to sort of see the future, but it's not just something way out in the distant future, something that you can actually grab onto right now is one of the exciting parts of that. And I know today's lecture is going to take us right there. Uh, it's a particular pleasure for me since I've known Paula for quite a long time. I'm not going to introduce you, no worries. But um, the ideas and uh, how to use these very small materials, I think she and I were both doing it back when nano wasn't cool, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, I think we both also started not working on biological problems, but from our various disciplines coming at it, uh, either as a chemist or chemical engineer. And one of the most exciting things has been to see the convergence of these very traditional chemical physics and engineering ideas and how they're beginning to infuse medicine. Uh, at this point in time, it's kind of amazing, but you used to go to conferences and talk about nanomaterials and the doctors would look at you like you're crazy. Uh, and really, we're talking about nanobots in the body. That's usually what they thought you were doing. And now, it is just in the fabric of medicine and we're seeing a lot of drugs and other things really come out and help people uh, both cure and detect disease. It's, it's really, um, no longer the future in that sense, but we're going to see from Paula where, where we'll be able to take it. So it's just a real pleasure to welcome you here to Brown. Uh, so with that, I'm going to um, ask Chris Rose to come up and do the official introduction for Paula. But again, thank you all for being here. Okay, so uh, I guess the way I normally start these things off, everybody has a program, right? Okay, per perfect. Open it. I think it's to page two, three, something like that. It's, the pic it's Paula's pictures under it. All right, and there's a bunch of stuff there, right? And, uh, you know, real accomplished, all of that. I'm not going to talk about that at all, just like I haven't spoken about that for any, anybody else, because everybody that's coming here to give this lecture, this sort of lecture, is accomplished, and it goes with the territory. So, but the... What, Vicky actually said something that kind of resonated. She, she said, don't worry, I'm not going to introduce you. Well, worry, Paula, because I've known Paula since she was a freshman. <laughs> we, uh, we overlapped at school. And the first time I saw Paula, actually, um, she, was, uh, she was holding a pom-pom. <laughs> she was a cheerleader at, at MIT. At, wait, at MIT? Do you understand what that means, at MIT? Um, but the other interesting thing is that there's a heritage that was started by uh, the speaker that's coming next, Jim Gates, of, um, I won't call it tutelage, though it was tutelage, but it was watching out for those that come behind you. So there was a tight, interested community. And Paula was one that we identified, she didn't know this at the time, but she was one that we identified as an up-and-comer. You know, smart, sharp as a tack, you know, brilliant in all sorts of dimensions, and with that drive. So it was with, and I'm sorry, Vicky, and well, Vicky, you're a chemist. You can be, you know, you're half chemist, half chemical engineering. But when we heard that she was declared chemical engineering, it was like, oh, my God. Now, you're looking at me like, what do you mean, chemical engineering? Why is that bad? Back then, it was petroleum, big vats of things, and, you know, just like, Ugh, you know, and it just seemed like a waste. But the interesting thing is um, Paula already kind of knew that this stuff that she was going to talk about maybe not in its, in its given avatar here, but that it was going to be the thing of the future. And if you look at her work, even some of her earlier work, she was already talking about nano before, just like Vicky said, nano was cool. So again, this Thinking Out Loud series is about bringing in folks that can see the future, are brilliant, and also, as I've said for everybody else, just a little crazy. You know, she saw things in a different sort of way. And it's really that thing that makes the most brilliant and wonderful science. So with that, let me introduce my brilliant and wonderful and beautiful friend, Paula Hammond. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Vicki. This is a real honor. I'm excited to be here at Brown University. 
I am incredibly impressed with my day here. Wonderful people, incredible, bright, brilliant minds, and the diversity that you all represent is, is just amazing to me, and it's something that we're really going to benefit from in our scientific community and in all of our communities. All right, I'm going to describe to you some of the work that we have been doing in NANO, and uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the work we're doing in cancer. We do work in a broad range of areas in which we deliver drugs, and uh, some of that includes uh, everything from orthopedic to wound healing. But cancer is particularly compelling, especially for the application of nanomaterial systems, and I'll explain that to you in just a minute. In fact, uh, nanoparticle drug delivery systems have been interesting because they have a unique capability to get into tumors. And there are several reasons for this. If you're able to introduce a nanoparticle into the bloodstream, and you're able to design it so that it can make its way throughout the bloodstream without getting cleared away, without being eliminated by the body, then when it reaches the vasculature, the blood vessels in the tumor, those tumor blood vessels, that vasculature is holy. It's defective. So there are these gaps within the vasculature of these very rapidly growing tumors. And those gaps allow small things to get into the tumor vasculature and out the other side into the tumor. We call this the enhanced permeation and retention effect. And we take advantage of the fact that the vasculature is smooth and uniform in the rest of the body, but in these tumor uh, regions, we can actually get nanoparticles to leak out. Now, the passive targeting that this allows um, means that when we have a nanoparticle that was, is within the range of a few tens of nanometers, some people believe up to 100, others believe up to 200 nanometers in size, you can get a larger portion of these nanoparticles into the tumor. And that gives you a longer time frame if that nanoparticle contains a drug to allow it to release that drug before it gets cleared away. So this is one of the reasons nanoparticles become interesting. Now, uh, we also think about the nanoparticle as a carrier, and we can incorporate a broad range of drugs into these carriers, everything from small molecule drugs, the kinds of things that we recognize for chemotherapy. Um, we can also introduce proteins and nucleic acids that can change the outcome of the disease, and I'll talk a little bit more about why we might want to do that. Finally, if we're going to use this nanoparticle system, I mentioned that we want to introduce it through the bloodstream. There are a few other ways in which we can introduce nanoparticles to the body, uh, but the bloodstream is the easiest access for us. In that sense, once that nanoparticle gets into the blood, there's a, there's a large number of proteins that can adsorb to the surface of that nanoparticle. If we have a nanoparticle that allows that adsorption to occur, it will rapidly be recognized as a foreign body by the immune cells in the bloodstream, uh, monocytes in particular, and there will be a mechanism which will allow them to be cleared from the body. This eliminates our opportunity for drug delivery. So we'd like to be able to design these nanoparticles so that they're not readily recognized by the immune system, by these uh, monocytes and macrophages, uh, we'd like to be able to decorate them so that they look essentially like their surrounding environment. And we often do this by using a polymer layer that gives us a huge amount of hydration. They essentially allow water molecules to bind to the surfaces of these nanoparticles and essentially allow these to, if you can imagine, float around as if they were in innocuous water molecules. If we could, the closest we can get to that uh, will allow us to get these through the bloodstream and allow them to accumulate in the tumor. So this is part of the construction of this nanoparticle vehicle. There is one final thing that we might want to do. Once the nanoparticle is able to get through the bloodstream, accumulate in the tumor through this passive targeting, we would like the tumor cells to actually take up the nanoparticle so that the drug cargo is able to get to the cell. Now, for this to happen, typically there can be nonspecific ways in which cells engage with the nanoparticle and take it up. And this can work. On the other hand, you may have a nanoparticle that just leaks its drug out in between these tumor cells, not really getting inside them, and that drug maybe can permeate through the cell membrane. 
But there are a number of drugs that are too hydrophobic, are not soluble, cannot get into the, uh, the media very readily, and therefore aren't taken up readily by cells. They need some help. And in this case, we like, like to allow the nanoparticle to engage the cell and get taken up. Now in this last process, we can use a range of different mechanisms. Tumor cells often overproduce uh, certain proteins, some of which are proteins that reside at the surfaces of cell membranes. And these receptors bind to ligands, which we can design ourselves or which we can use uh, from natural materials. If we can attach the ligands to the outer surface of the nanoparticle, we can enable binding of the nanoparticle to tumor cells and that will allow what we call receptor-mediated endocytosis or uptake. And in that case, we can greatly increase the number of these nanoparticles that cells take up. That means that the nanoparticle containing our, gar our cargo will get in. So let's go over this uh, briefly with a cartoon. We have a core which contains drug molecules, shown here as these yellow balls, uh, and that nanoparticle can encapsulate it. We put down a hydrated layer for stealth, and then we introduce molecular ligands, represented by these small triangles here, which can bind tumor cells specifically and induce cell uptake. So this is the generic or general idea of a targeted nanoparticle. And the sizes of these nanoparticles, uh, again, uh, can be compared to the sizes of, let's say, an antibody um, or a virus, somewhere in that range there. Now, in our own laboratory, we use a few different tool sets that we have to design these nanoparticles. And we're thinking about all of these different uh, sorts of needs that we have in the design of the nanoparticle. So to introduce these different uh, kinds of systems, we're, we're thinking, of course, of, of increasing or enhancing therapy and increasing the availability of the drug. One that I'll talk to you about today is uh, a smart targeting system. In this case, uh, one of the key features is that we can actually design these molecules which self-assemble and encapsulate the drug and present ligands on the surface in a very specific manner that can greatly enhance cell uptake simply through the geometric uh, clustering of the ligand. And we use polymer chemistry to actually make these molecules. And the second that I'll describe to you is a combination system. It actually takes advantage of the fact that we can use a method called layer by layer assembly, which is an electrostatic assembly process. I'll describe to you in more detail soon. But it allows us to wrap uh, molecule, molecular layers around a nanoparticle. The nanoparticle itself can contain a drug, and these wrapped layers can actually contain a second drug, and ultimately an outer layer which gives us the stealth and the ligand targeting that we want. So these two I'll describe in more detail. And uh, finally, there is a third system that I won't describe today, but it's a new approach to make uh, nucleic acids, in particular ones uh, uh, short interfering RNA, which are interesting for turning genes off in very high density. So this is a new development in our lab, and hopefully I'll have a chance to talk to you about those in the future. All right, so I'll describe these two different mechanisms uh, by which we assemble nanoparticles and what their advantages are. In the first case, uh, for these smart targeting systems, uh, we were actually informed by nature, by biology. It turns out that from a number of cell biology studies, uh, people had begun to understand that uh, these cells, when they express receptors uh, on their surfaces, will often have receptors that need to bind in a certain way with each other so that there is a coordinated, in, uh, coordinated um, arrangement that is needed for signaling to take place. And there are also several examples in which uh, the number of, of uh, receptors that are bound impact the degree of signaling that takes place inside the cell, which leads to the desired, uh, the desired action. So in this case, what we're doing is looking at this understanding. And uh, there were studies which suggested that if you cluster ligands together on a surface, and uh, in particular in cell adhesion studies, it was found that you can use smaller amounts of the ligand uh, 
but get a much greater adhesion and mobility of the cell if you cluster them in, in very well-defined sets of uh, somewhere between six and, 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 and 12. So we thought maybe there is something about the way the receptors we're trying to target on tumor cells that would also respond to ligands more effectively if we generate them in clusters and distribute those clusters uh, along the surface of our nanoparticle. And this led to the development of a new polymer system. Now, and typically, what we would do is make a polymer system. These are these large macromolecule systems in which we have two blocks, uh, a, a length of molecular repeat, here shown in blue, which is very water-soluble, and one shown here in red, which is not water-soluble. Uh, when these gather together, when they assemble in water, the hydrophobic groups will cluster in the core and we'll be able to encapsulate drug into that core region. Uh, then this water-soluble region uh, is allowed to be presented and for the one that we chose, which is polyethylene oxide, it can present this very hydrated stealth layer. All right, and then we can attach a ligand. So this is a standard sort of approach, uh, linear block copolymer. But pr the problem here is that when the ligand is presented, we can't really control whether or not it's presented in a cluster. So we move to uh, a block copolymer in which the hydrophobic block is a polypeptide that is hydrophobic. And the hydrophilic part is actually this highly branched molecule, a dendromer. Uh, so we refer to these as linear dendritic block copolymers. And at the very ends of these branched dendromers, we have the short polyethylene oxide blocks that are very water-soluble and neutral. And to that, we can attach ligands if we want. So here, what we're showing in this cartoon is that we have polyethylene oxide end groups that have nothing but just a hydroxyl group, which is water-soluble at the end, and those are shown in blue. And we can also functionalize them with varying degrees of a ligand. In our case, we chose folic acid, which binds to the folate receptor, which is overexpressed in ovarian cancer cells and a range of other types of cancer cells. And we can then mix them together and produce a self-assembled micelle in which the core can contain drug, but the outer regions have these pre-clustered arrangements already present on their surface. And we can, of course, vary uh, the amount of clustering on the surface in terms of the number of clusters and the size of the cluster. And by controlling this ligand presentation, we can actually generate mixed micelles that can give us selective targeting. This, is, uh, this work was done before our cryogenic TEM microscope arrived on campus. And for those of you who do any kind of electron microscopy imaging, uh, you know that typically we're in the dry state uh, as we move along, you'll see systems in which we are looking at the system in the hydrated state. But in this early work, what we did was cast the micelles onto surfaces in the dry state and label them with a dye which labels uh, using uh, an, ad an atomic dye or label uh, the clusters. And we can see that we can make micelles with many small clusters or with a few large clusters and everything in between. All right. There's some chemists in the room, right? Can I see a show of hands for chemists? All right, all right, I see some representation. So you guys are not frightened by this slide and the rest of you can just ignore it, okay? <laughs> so this is the structure of this uh, nanoparticle system in which we have a polybenzyl L aspartate block. It's polypeptide, uh, repeat here, uh, protected uh, acid group here with this, uh, aspir uh, this uh, benzyl group. And uh, the second block, is actually um, this polyester dendromer. It can hydrolyze very readily through the ester linkages, which makes it uh, a fairly biocompatible system. So we have a polypeptide, which is reasonably compatible, and we have this polyester also quite compatible. And to this, we've attached PEG, which is polyethylene glycol, is also known to be compatible. We use the free acid, free acid groups we've attached here to uh, essentially do chemistry in which we attach the folic acid group. There are 16 end groups on each of the dendromers. So this is what the system looks like. Uh, when it self-assembles, it forms micelles that are uh, 50 to 100 nanometers, typically about 80 nanometers in diameter. And uh, they're very stable. In fact, you have to dilute them down 
uh, uh, below 10 to the minus 8 molar before they begin to break apart, which means they'll be stable in the bloodstream. They won't fall apart in the bloodstream. All right, so the question that we asked was, if we present these clusters in differing sizes from 1 to 2 to 3, et cetera, by changing the degree of functionalization of the dendromer, will we see a difference in how much that my cell wants to bind to a tumor cell? High binding is what we want because we want this nanoparticle to reside long enough for this receptor-mediated endocytosis to take place. So we'll get greater uptake um, if we can get higher binding. And uh, what we did was we functionalized the dendromer to varying degrees. We have 16N groups, and we varied the degree of functionalization from 10% to 100%, which means we went from 1.6 on average folates per dendromer to 16 on average folates per dendromer. Everything's on average because this is the real world and, and we're doing chemistry, so it's stochastic. However, it gives us a general idea of what's going on. And to measure how strongly these bind, for each of these micellar systems, we measured the KD, uh, the dissociation constant. And uh, in this case, we're looking for a very small number. Um, when we look at the 10% folate, we see that we're getting 10 to the minus 9th. We're at nanomolar. That's great. That's very good binding. But uh, what we find is that if we go to 20%, which is on average about 3, 3 to 4 of these folates in a cluster, we see that we get two orders of magnitude change in that binding avidity from 10 to the minus 9th to 10 to the minus 11. So essentially, we're getting 100 times better binding in these systems. Now, they have the same amount of folate molecule on them. And we sort of did this by mixing them with non-functionalized material so that everything has roughly 2,000 folates per micelle. And yet, this is binding more strongly. And as we begin to increase the cluster size, we see the number stays around 10 to the minus 11 for a while and then begins to jump up. So we're seeing a slow decline in the ability for it to bind as it gets larger. So there's some sort of sweet spot here. Uh, what can we learn about that sweet spot? Here are the systems that bind fairly well. And in particular, this one in blue, the three to four folates, binds extremely well. We can then take these systems and look at the average amount of uptake that tumor cells have with these systems. And these are tumor cells that overexpress the folate receptor. Um, and what we're finding is that as we go from non-functionalized systems where we just have this sort of non-specific uptake, we're looking at fluorescence uh, intensity um, and because we have a labeled nanoparticle that is fluorescent. And we're seeing that the fluorescence of these cells is going up as we increase the uptake. And here's our 20% number. And we're seeing that it goes up to a peak and then slowly drops off, much like we see with the binding avidity. So we tried to think about this in a physical way. Why would this uh, threemer of folate, when it's clustered together, work better than any of the other systems? And what we did was essentially explore um, how big of an umbrella this dendromer makes in or around the cell membrane surface. And what we see is that we can sort of map out that region. If uh, we know how big the receptor is, we can also map out how many receptors fit in that umbrella or cone uh, over which this dendron should uh, be uh, represented on the surface. And we figure that about six binding uh, opportunities are available. Uh, from this dendron, uh, and when we're just at one folate per cluster, we are not optimizing the amount of binding that we can get in these systems. However, we do see that there's an enhancement in binding avidity, and we see an enhancement in uptake. And we should see some sort of optimization when we get to um, this five to six number. What's interesting is that we actually see this occur at three rather than five to six. And in looking in the literature, we found that people have studied these folate receptors. For those of you who study biology, they, they float around on raft, uh, basically on uh, raft, uh, lipid rafts. So they, they're very uh, mobile, and they can cluster together. When they're overexpressed in tumor cells, they tend to be clustered in groups of three or four. So it could be that this is simply the natural way in which this is expressed in tumor cells because tumor cells are overexpressing them. And now you're beginning to see 
these lipid raft aggregates. Now, if we go to higher numbers, and you remember that we get to a point where we're really losing this game, uh, we, we think that we're seeing steric hindrance. These folate molecules are getting in each other's way in trying to bind to the folate receptor. We did do the math and the modeling to determine if there is a positive cooperativity between these systems uh, and uh, compared to a normal uh, system. And we find that it is actually a negative cooperativity, meaning the more you add, the harder, uh, they, ha a harder time they have in binding together. Then we, we thought, okay, can we use this in some sort of therapy? And what we do in simple examinations of efficacy is we use subcutaneous tumors. That means we essentially inject tumor cells on the flanks of mice, and uh, we allow them to grow into tumor lumps, as you can see here. And uh, then we treat the tumor by doing a tail vein injection and allowing the nanoparticles to pull, and we look at where they are. These images are images of mice where there's a tumor on the left that does not express the folate receptor. And on the right, we have a tumor that does express the folate receptor. And when we introduce our 0% folate mixture, but tail vein injection and wait for 24 hours, we see that our mice don't really have any accumulation of nanoparticle. That's long enough for the enhanced permeation and retention effect to take place and be gone. Usually, it's, it's like a pinball machine. You, you get the nanoparticle in, it goes around through the bloodstream, it begins to accumulate in the tumor, reaches a peak, and slowly begins to roll out, begins to make its way out again. It lasts about 24 hours. After that, there should be fairly low accumulation. However, with our folate-targeted nanoparticles, we found that there is accumulation, and it's actually quite high. Here, the blue color indicates high intensity, and the red indicates low intensity. So we can see the highest intensity in our 20% folate material. We can also see this quantitatively in the diagram here, 20% folate, much higher amount of uptake. Uh, and this is compared in a ratio manner with the other tumor and uh, also with other controls that we use. When we go up to the higher amounts, those, uh, those crowded clusters, we see that we get a drop back down again and uh, the uptake is fairly low in these tumors. So there is some real correlation. Again, in this early work, we were interested in whether or not we could target a tumor and treat it. So we filled these nanoparticles with paclitaxel, taxol, um, a well-known chemotherapy drug, and we wanted to compare it to regular paclitaxel. Now, this gets to the whole reason why we're interested in targeting in the first place. Uh, when we are administering chemotherapy to patients, we're typically administering the drug directly to them, and it impacts not just the tumor cell, but other cells, especially cells that are rapidly growing. Typically what happens is that there is a toxic response to the chemotherapy drug. And because we can't just drug the tumor, we're, we end up drugging the entire body. And we end up with all of these chemotherapy side effects. That not only change, makes it uh, extremely difficult for the patient, uh, these side effects can be quite extreme. They themselves can be uh, fatal. Uh, but it also makes it harder for the patient to recover, and it makes it more difficult uh, for us to dose enough drug to be effective because we can't go beyond a certain amount before the, the patient is too ill. So here we're comparing uh, the tumor volume, how big the tumor is growing, how much it's growing, in uh, a regular mouse that has no treatment in black, shown here, and uh, in the unpackaged material, the material that contains no drug, and we compare that to paclitaxel at a low dose, two and a half mg per kilogram. And we see a little bit effect of, of paclitaxel, but when we package it in the folate targeted system, we end up with uh, four times uh, less tumor growth. So we see some efficacy, and we can see this also when we compare the mouse tumor in the targeted treatment versus the paclitaxel at the same dose. There's a huge difference in uh, the sizes of the tumor. We can also see that the nanoparticle has caused cell death. When we actually section the tumor, uh, we have a stain which stains the dead cells red, and we can see that cell death is much more um, uh, apparent in the tumor that has been treated with the targeted treatment uh, compared to, let's say, a control in saline. 
Finally, we look at how long these mice survive. And we see that this targeted treatment allows the mice to survive for significantly longer uh, compared to, in these lines here, the amount of time that the uh, untreated mice uh, can live or the mice which had the same treatment without the nanoparticle. So we've moved from this system to trying to design the interior of the block copolymer. You know, so we've been talking about this outer region and how we can optimize clustering, but that's only a part of this drug delivery uh, approach. We also want to be able to very effectively encapsulate the drug. I mentioned that the nanoparticle goes through the bloodstream, and some of you may have been thinking, all right, if there's drug inside of it, is the drug leaking out during the entire time period that it's circulating through your blood? That's not good, right? It's a, it's a toxin. Chemotherapy drugs are poisons that are meant to kill the tumor. So can we make a nanoparticle that is stable in the bloodstream, won't release, and then when it gets to the tumor, begins to release? Well, to do that, we have to essentially design polymer systems that are intelligent, so to speak, in that they respond to their environment. And there are several ways in which we can do that. Um, if we're trying to deliver genes, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, we need to be able to encapsulate the gene uh, using charge and then release it when it gets into uh, the cell. And if we're encapsulating drugs, then we want something typically that's going to be hydrophobic uh, and will allow the drug to sequester inside your uh, nanoparticle uh, and you also want something that's going to release when it's inside the cell. When the nanoparticle is taken up, it goes into a compartment, an endosome, which uh, then buffers down to a low pH. And that endosome becomes acidified. Um, you actually have an opportunity to design a drug uh, a carrier that responds to that low pH by release. So we looked at trying to design the interior of these systems by taking the same kind of polypeptide that we were using before that sequesters the hydrophobic drug, but designing it so that it's hydrophobic at uh, pH 7.4, which is our bloodstream pH, but at lower pH values, it begins to become unstable, becomes more hydrophilic, and therefore becomes water soluble and releases the drug. So in designing these pH responsive systems, uh, we decided to stick with the polypeptide because it's biocompatible and begin to attach different amine groups to them. Amines are basic groups. They buffer at a range of different pHs. And when they begin to buffer, they become positively charged and they become water soluble. When we began to work with this design, and I won't, I won't show you the chemistry in this case to uh, keep everything simple, uh, but we, we found that they actually form vesicles, much like liposomes. So we had these uh, vesicular structures, and we found that they uh, essentially do fall apart at low pH. So we can encapsulate uh, something like doxorubicin, which is actually a hydrophilic drug in the interior of these uh, vesicles. And then we can look at their rate of release and find that in PBS, they release very little. Uh, however, when they are in this uh, pH 5.5, which is close to the endosomal pH, we can see a very, um, very nice and complete release over a time period of within a day. So we have been designing these pH responsive systems and examining where they uh, distribute in uh, a mouse. So typically we'll look at uh, where we see accumulation of the nanoparticle and try to understand uh, what that accumulation is over time. And uh, for those of you who do work in drug delivery, you understand why we need to ask these questions. We need to know how much of it goes to the liver and the kidney and places that we would rather not see it, and uh, whether or not that leads to any kind of toxicity. What we did was then treat mice that had tumors and measure again the size of the tumor and here you can see that size represented by, again, a luminescent signal for the untreated mouse over a period of time. And what we found was in our pH responsive system compared to free doxorubicin, uh, we saw essentially um, some uh, decrease in the rate of growth of the tumor and even uh, over shorter time periods, some regression of the tumor. Now, uh, we're also interested in encapsulating uh, 
other kinds of drugs. One kind of drug is siRNA. I mentioned it earlier. Some of you are very familiar with this. Others, it may be a newer concept. But the idea is that uh, when tumor cells are, are, originate, they originate from genetic dysregulation. There's a gene that goes haywire, that goes wrong. And that, uh, dis that dysregulation of the gene leads to not only the cancer-like behavior, the growth without regulation, for example, but it also leads to several new pathways that those tumor cells have to avoid dying. It's sort of a, you know, an amazing thing, cancer, because once generated, these tumor cells are more difficult to kill over time. And uh, they are also very diverse. They are different ones which have different kinds of genetic changes that they've undergone. Now, it turns out that if you can understand what those genetic pathways are and how they allow the tumor cell to survive, there are ways in which you can turn off the genes that are enabling them. So we're going to basically try to stop that enabling gene from being functional in a tumor cell. SIRNA, silencing RNA, is uh, RNA which binds to um, essentially uh, the, the uh, machinery, the RNA machinery that allows the production of that protein. It can stop a gene. It's a way of turning a gene off. We can think of it that way. And siRNA has been of interest in the field of medicine for quite some time because you can actually address many diseases by turning off errant genes that are essentially uh, allowing cancer cells to survive, uh, influencing disease in other ways. Now, it turns out that all genetic material, nucleic acids, RNA, DNA, are negatively charged. And if we want to deliver them, we need to use uh, methods which allow us to encapsulate these negatively charged species and get them into the cell cytoplasm where they can do all of their work. So we're using nucleic acid binding as um, a, an approach in which we can use this very charged region at the end of this polypeptide. So we're making our same polypeptide that you saw before, but we're adding this, uh, this quaternary um, uh, ammonium salt so that we can get nucleic acid binding. We also mix that with systems which have the polyethylene glycol system that allows us to get through the blood, uh, bloodstream. It's, it also prevents uh, breakdown of the RNA. And finally, we, we have something, uh, this is a zwitterion. It's an acid attached to an amine. And essentially, this amino acid is going to allow us endosomal buffering, and that buffering is going to allow us to escape the endosome. All right, so when we combine these systems together with RNA, in our case, we're using a protected kind of RNA, uh, we can actually generate a system which forms a micellar particle and uh, these are actually relatively small. This is a 20 nanometer bar. It's a little harder to see here, but there's a bit of a, an outer uh, shell around this region, and that is uh, our stealth layer of polyethylene glycol. SIRNA is adsorbed uh, within this uh, layer, and uh, we can then use this as a delivery vehicle for siRNA. Uh, we refer to these as lipid-like peptide nanoparticles. They're about 90, 90 nanometers in diameter, so they can actually fit in this enhanced permeation and retention. Um, and they have a fairly long blood half-life. They can survive in the bloodstream for a fairly long period of time. Now, I mentioned pathways. And for those of you who are interested in biology, or those of you who are working in biology, um, I, I want to give credit to some more recent work we've been doing with Michael Yaffe, who is a biologist, a faculty member, who is also in the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. Uh, he's been a great collaborator. What he does is essentially examine these genetic pathways I was talking about. I mentioned that there are multiple ways to maintain survival uh, in the presence of something like DNA damage. DNA damage is what a lot of our chemotherapy drugs do. That's how they induce killing uh, or stress in uh, cells. And it turns out that because there are many pathways, we have to look at these pathways and understand when a genetic pathway has been changed, how we might be able to prevent that cell from surviving chemotherapy. Uh, and one of these pathways for ovarian cancer and for certain kinds of lung cancer that uh, we have 
determined with Michael is uh, this MAP kinase protected kinase activated protein kinase 2. We'll just call it MK2 for short. This gene uh, actually helps cells survive uh, when they do not have uh, P53, which is another gene. That gene, this one is a regulator. But when this gene is no longer present, which is the case for ovarian cancer and a range of other cancers, uh, MK2 becomes an active participant in enabling survival of tumor cells. If we can block MK2, we can make it harder for them to survive chemotherapy. And this is just an example, uh, last example of, of how these peptide systems can work. We've been examining them in lung cancer and in ovarian cancer. We've encapsulated the siRNA and delivered it and also uh, introduced um, a very common drug, cisplatin. This is the chemotherapy drug in a separate injection. So these, this is our nanoparticle of siRNA injected three times uh, in a mouse that has had tumors growing over two weeks. And this is a very sophisticated mouse model. In this case, the tumors are actually in the lung and they're metastatic. Uh, and in this mouse model, we can examine uh, the size of the tumor and how much it regresses, if it does at all. And uh, what we found was that the tumor burden, and these are many little tumors, so we have to measure the sizes of all of these tumors and average them out. Uh, and we can measure that tumor burden um, after the first, second, and third week of treatment. And the control here is uh, just cisplatin by itself, just the drug by itself, and a scrambled siRNA that doesn't do anything, just codes for nothing compared to the, the siRNA that blocks MK2 in cisplatin. And you can see a huge difference when you just administer cisplatin, which does um, actually have some effect, but not as much effect. We can see that the tumor is still growing rapidly, um, compared to uh, essentially the fold change that we can see uh, when we are administering the cisplatin drug. We can also, with, with the siRNA, we can also see, again, enhanced survival in the mice that, contain, that are administered the combination drug, as shown here, uh, out 50 to 60 days compared to, let's say, 30, so extending that lifetime. In ovarian tumors, we're uh, earlier in the process, so all of these results are quite preliminary, but we found, again, that there's uh, some meaningful difference in these systems uh, in terms of the uh, tumor burden. Now, um, we're moving toward combining what we've done with the inside with what we were doing with the outside and presenting ligands in a very functional fashion and creating these uh, systems which contain the PP, this, uh, basically this uh, polypeptide system that I described in more detail with the uh, dendromer that can present ligand in clusters. And this work is ongoing now. So we'll take a breather for a minute. <laughs> and change topics to the second area in which uh, we're using a very different approach to generate nanoparticles. But first, um, I wanted to mention why we might need a different approach. Right, we've been talking about introducing uh, therapeutics, and you, uh, you notice that I mentioned that siRNA is compelling because you can turn off a gene that um, allows a tumor cell to survive, right? So if you can turn off that gene and introduce the chemotherapy drug effectively to the same cell, then you can really beat cancer. Now, the problem here is this. Um, for me to get the same cell to receive the siRNA that turns off the gene and receive the chemotherapy drug, I need to introduce a reasonably large amount of the chemotherapy drug and quite a bit of siRNA. And the reason for that is that once you introduce things into the bloodstream, you're only able to target a little bit. Targeting is, is good. It enhances things. But it doesn't mean that every cell has the same experience. So some cells may just get siRNA. Some cells may just get chemotherapy drug. You can see that that can impact efficiency. It would be beautiful if we could design one nanoparticle that delivered everything. Because once it got into the cell compartment, we would then be able to deliver both of our components. On top of that, there's this compelling concept that if you're able to change the sequence or the rate at which you deliver the drug so that 
you first deliver the thing that turns off the gene and wait, and then deliver the chemotherapy drug, you could be more effective. It turns out that for certain gene pathways, it takes time to turn things off, to turn the machinery off. So sequence is also something that interests us. And we love our block copolymer systems, but we can't do all of that with the block copolymer. However, in another part of our lab, we're working with polyelectrolytes. These are positively charged and negatively charged materials. And uh, we're following those basic rules that positive and negative attract to build very thin films. Okay, so the way we do this uh, in a nutshell, this is a, a cartoon uh, showing a slide, a glass slide. And that glass slide, you might imagine, has a net negative charge, if we've cleaned it really well, a native negative charge. We can immerse that slide into a dilute aqueous solution that, that contains a polycation, something that is positively charged and multivalent. Uh, we can then rinse off anything that's not truly electrostatically absorbed. So when you stick this in, the polycation is going to be attracted to that negative charge. It's going to absorb until ultimately the surface becomes positively charged. Make sense? Right? So now you can actually see that you'd have a positively charged surface and positively charged material and solution, they repel each other. So you no longer get deposition. So it's a self-limiting absorption process. You can rinse anything that's not truly absorbed and now dip it into another water solution that contains a negatively charged material. So back and forth, you can absorb positive, negative, positive, negative, and build up these alternating layers, sandwich style, in which you control what goes into the film as long as you maintain plus minus plus minus alternation. This means that you can generate layers which contain different things as long as you follow the rules. You can do the same thing with hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. So why is this interesting for drug delivery? It turns out that you can incorporate anything that is compatible in water. There are a range of drugs that are nucleic acids or proteins that are very sensitive to processing with polymers, with solvents, uh, and with temperature, but you can deposit them in water and absorb them in their most active form. And this allows us to get a very active form of a biologic drug into a very thin film. There are some other tricks too, reasons why this is interesting. And part of that is the fact that uh, when you absorb these materials into the film, you get a lot in. Uh, typically when we just dissolve a drug in a polymer, we can only get about one weight percent, a small amount, and that's just because of the thermodynamics of polymer chains. However, when you're playing the role of alternating absorption, uh, you're seeking electrostatic compensation. So you're going to absorb net roughly similar amounts of material in each layer. And in playing that thermodynamic game, you can actually get up to 50% of your material uh, to be the drug, and in some cases even more. Typically in the systems I'll describe, we're looking at anywhere from 10 to 40% loading. So those are some real advantages. Now, we do this a lot on big surfaces. And when we do them on big surfaces, we can, can, we can introduce different drugs in different layers. We can do fancy things with orthopedics and with wound healing. But it turns out you can also do these on tiny surfaces. And one of these surfaces that we work with is a nanoparticle. We can take a nanoparticle which is already known to us, a PLGA nanoparticle, polylactic glycolic acid, one that is FDA approved and we can stuff things into the core. Or a liposome, also FDA approved, already used in chemotherapy. We can take a liposome and stuff things into the core of it and it's going to be nanosized and charged on the outside. So we can then begin to absorb layer by layer film on the outside of the nanoparticle. And in doing so, we get these very nice conformal layers. Now, what we're absorbing in our case are layers which contain siRNA so that we can turn off a gene. Now we have an ability to incorporate the chemotherapy drug in the core, and the siRNA, which is on the outer region, should be released first and downregulate the pathway of interest. Finally, this outer layer is important because it determines where the nanoparticle is going to end up. If the outer layer is actually something that engages a bunch of proteins in the bloodstream, it's going to end up uh, going out <laughs> of the body uh, through all of the mechanisms that we're familiar with without having any impact. 
However, if we are able to decorate it so that it has the stealth property I talked about, and if it also has some ability to bind tumor cells specifically, we can actually target a tumor. So let's talk about how we can use this. But first, some of you are thinking, wait, how are you going to put this stuff on a nanoparticle? So um, there are ways in which this is done. Uh, the one that's most common is to take centrifuge tube that contains your solution of nanoparticle. Um, you introduce or titrate in your aqueous solution, wait a certain amount of time for absorption to take place, and then centrifuge that down, decant and isolate the nanoparticles, and then do the next step. It takes a lot of work. And we're actually working on a much faster way of doing that, which during Q&A I'd be happy to address. Now there's a more um, easily used method of isolating nanoparticles using hollow uh, fiber filtration. Has, have any of you heard or used a hollow fiber filtration method before? All right. It might be the chemical engineer back there or something, a mechanical? Ah, all right, all right. Engineers have used this method for some time to isolate different materials. What well, turns out that it works for our nanoparticles too. So rather than having to centrifuge these down, you just throw them through a filter, um, this kind of filter, and you can actually isolate them fairly well. So now we're beginning to adapt to that, and my students are very happy that we are, as you can imagine. Now when you're building these films, here's an example of starting with a quantum dot, tiny 20 nanometer nanoparticle we chose because it glows, essentially. We can, we can track it. And we start with something that is 20 nanometers, and we build each layer, and we see that it grows in size, but in a nice linear fashion. That's what a good layer-by-layer -layer film is going to do. And it uh, gets up um, maybe a, a, about uh, 5 to 6 nanometers per adsorbed layer. We can also measure the charge on these systems. They start off negative, go positive, negative, positive, nice alternation between plus and minus with each deposited layer, a sign that we are building up these materials. And uh, it's hard for you guys to see this, but the quantum dot is tiny, but you can see a little quantum dot core with a kind of uh, less dense uh, polymer shell in that uh, micrograph. All right, so we can build these up, but hey, they're built out of electrostatic interactions. And a lot of you who work in biology know that the body is filled with things that are electrostatic and which bind to polymers. Will these be stable? in the bloodstream. So we actually tested this and we found that um, we could use the same quantum dot approach and label one of our polymers and track it. If we just have this one bilayer on the quantum dot in dextran sulfate, we found with a tail vein injection, here's our mouse, look where it's lit up. In five minutes, the bladder lights up. Okay, we're losing poly L lysine. And uh, over 30 minutes, the bladder lights up multiple times, uh, we're losing this uh, material, yeah, the body's getting rid of it, uh, it's falling apart. And we found that out because in a similar vein, we looked at where the quantum dot is, and the quantum dot does not track with the poly L lysine, it hangs around a little longer, comes out at a different time, so this whole thing is sort of falling apart. We found that if we introduce just one more layer, when we go uh, from uh, one to three, uh, we actually get a much more stable system and when you tail vein eject, it doesn't show up in the bladder or the feces anymore. It does accumulate more in the liver than we would like, and this is the liver region. However, if we use a different outer layer, dextran sulfate is a sugar, it's a common sugar, um, but we think it actually is binding to some receptors that are expressed in the liver, in what are called Kupfer cells. So, if we use hyaluronic acid, this is an acid, uh, it's, a, it's a polymer that is in the extracellular matrix. It's present in our body, throughout our body. Um, it's what much of our tissue is made of. You can also get it in the cosmetics counter uh, at a high price. There are a number of hyaluronic acid enhanced cosmetics these days which poof your skin up. They're extremely hydrated molecules. Um, they are also uh, negatively charged. Now we introduce these negatively charged, highly hydrated hyaluronic acid on the outside and tell vein inject the mouse, and look, this nice, clean, uh, light up all over the bloodstream of, of the mouse that extends out for, you know, essentially a couple, what looks like a couple of days. It actually, half-life is more like about 18 hours. And uh, here you can see some of that half-life data, looking at the quantum dot getting ejected very rapidly, the dextran sulfate, hangs around but not very long, and the hyaluronic acid hanging around for much longer. 
We looked at whether it accumulates in the tumor via the enhanced permeation and retention effect. And at 24 hours, we can see that nice light up of tumors on the backs of mice. And we can also track it, and we can see that this intensity actually increases up to about um, this 8 to 12 hour period, and then around 24 hours, it begins to drop down. Again, the pinball machine. So let's take a closer look at this system. Because one of the things we're interested in in targeting is not only using size, but using chemistry. And chemistry can include ligands, but there are other ways in which chemistry can engage the tumor. It turns out the tumors grow really fast. The fact that they grow really fast means a few things. One, that the blood vessels they generate are kind of defective and leaky. So we can use enhanced permeation retention. Two, the fact that they can't generate enough blood vessels rapidly enough uh, that they can get oxygen effectively to the mass of the tumor makes tumors what we call hypoxic. They don't have enough oxygen. Not having enough oxygen causes these cells to generate uh, uh, in a way such that there's a low pH, a more acidic environment. So hypoxia might be a way in which you can cause a, a particle to be smart and change its interactions in the bloodstream versus in the tumor. So um, in this case, it turns out that the hyaluronic acid layered with poly -L lysine which is a, a synthetic polypeptide that's positively charged, actually gives us an interesting effect. At bloodstream pH 7.4, it's net negatively charged, about minus 30 millivolts. And it has this thin layer. Can you guys see that? This is a thin little shadow layer on the outer region. When you take it down to just pH 6, which is um, you know, a more acidic environment, you see that it swells. It also loses its negative charge. It turns out that these polyelectrolyte multilayers are nanoscale blends. And they actually can express isoelectric points that correspond to the two groups that are expressed by these polyelectrolytes. That means that at a certain point, it can flip from negative to positive. And what we see here is that it's on, that, on its way. It's becoming near neutral. Some measurements, we see a slight positive charge. It's got a softer, mushier shell. And the cell actually takes up much more of that. So here we're looking at relative cell uptake. And at pH 7.4, it's low. And it jumps up as we go to lower pHs. So in a hypoxic environment, we can actually get much more cell uptake. That means that we can have this nanoparticle going through the bloodstream. It's not really engaging anyone or anything. But when it gets into the tumor, it becomes sticky. And that's what we'd like to do. This is just um, a way of measuring this. We can take a tumor spheroid model. This is just clumps of cells that are made up of tumor cells. And we can stain our nanoparticles red here. Um, the nuclei are stained blue, and they're always present. And uh, we've stained for actin, also always present. Uh, but we're also looking for hypoxia in these uh, systems. Uh, so in this case, we can see that at pH 7.4, we don't get much nanoparticle accumulation. But at pH 6.0, we really light up. We get a lot of accumulation in these tumor spheroids. And uh, we can stain for hypoxia using uh, HIF-1-alpha, which is expressed in hypoxic tumors is a green stain and nanoparticles in red. And we can see a direct overlap, the hypoxic regions, in this case, of a tumor section. This is an histology section. Uh, indicate that we're getting a co-accumulation here. OK. So we've got targeting based on uh, the size. We've got targeting based on hypoxia. Now we'd like to be able to also engage those receptors that are overexpressed on tumor cells. There are a number of tumor cells that overexpress a receptor that's labeled CD44. Um, it turns out that CD44, which is present on all cells, is overexpressed in a range of, uh, of common solid tumors, including breast, colon, and ovarian uh, tumors. It also turns out that hyaluronic acid binds to CD44. And uh, when it's overexpressed, we can greatly enhance that uptake. So, when we actually work with ovarian tumors and a number of lung tumors, we find that we can get uh, a kind of binding affinity or uptake that is greatly enhanced uh, when we have C the uh, hyaluronic acid on the outer region. And we can see the overlap between CD44 and the nanoparticles in this uh, section here. You can see stromal cells on the outside and the real tumor cells on the inside.
we penetrate the stroma and we actually are getting into the tumors in these cases. All right, so now we have kind of the triple threat, as you might call it, right? We have uh, targeting by size, targeting by tumor microenvironment, and targeting by ligand. So the TTT, tumor triple threat. And you can see the effect of this when you look at our other layer by layer nanoparticles which don't have hyaluronic acid and don't exhibit some of these properties I described, you do a tail vein injection. On the left, we have luciferized tumors, so they glow. And these are the tumors on the left here. And when you inject and then you change your um, uh, wavelength so that you're observing the particles instead, you can see the overlap is not very high. A little in the tumor and a whole bunch in the, in the liver. Um, on the other hand, if you look at the hyaluronic acid LBL systems, we can see a meaningful difference. We still get something in the tumor, in the liver, and this is a common issue with nanoparticle delivery. But we see that there's a much greater amount that has accumulated in the tumor. So finally, um, here's an example of how we can use this dual targeting approach. Um, we can, uh, our triple targeting approach. We can load up a nanoparticle which contains a chemotherapy drug. We can layer siRNA, and that siRNA is meant to turn down the resistance mechanism so that these cells will die uh, when we introduce chemotherapy. And we can introduce our stealth layer which gives us the triple threat targeting. And this is what we did. Uh, we chose, uh, here you can actually see a, a close up of these layer by layer systems again for those of you who are interested. When we adsorb siRNA into the layers, um, we get about 3,000 copies or 3,000 siRNA molecules on average per nanoparticle. So we have a, a nice loading of these systems with just one uh, tetralayer. And we see that we can get very controlled release of the siRNA in the cytoplasm of cells in in vitro experiments. So let's move right on to uh, examining these systems in the body. First, we wanted to know whether or not they would go through the bloodstream for a long time or whether they'd just be eliminated rapidly. And it turns out that these systems have a really long hour, a really long half-life, 28-hour half-life, which for um, a number of nanoparticle systems is, is fairly rare. And we think it's because of this hyaluronic acid outer coating. So we can get this into the bloodstream and it will hang out there for a long time. Now if we take a liposome as our core, and inside we're going to put uh, doxorubicin, and outside we're going to layer siRNA, we're going to build our nanoparticle. So let's talk about what we're targeting. We're actually targeting triple negative breast cancer. Um, it's a kind of breast cancer which isn't well addressed by the targeted therapies that have already been developed, Herceptin or any of the hormone therapies, uh, uh, estrogen or progesterone. Uh, and for that reason, we don't have a magic bullet for it yet. It turns out that triple negative breast cancer also has some unique pathways to avoid cell death. One of them is a pump uh, called MRP1. It, when doxorubicin, which is water soluble and is a DNA damage drug, gets into these cells, it actually pumps it out. How many people have fed a baby before? And you know, when the baby doesn't like it and it comes back out again? Okay. This is what these cells can do. You get the chemotherapy in and it just pushes it back out again, making doxorubicin a very ineffective therapeutic uh, mode for triple negative breast cancer, in particular when it's recurrent and these cells become more resistant. So in this recurrent aggressive phase, um, we look at treatment uh, by introducing siRNA that can actually block that um, mechanism. And, uh, we then deliver the doxorubicin. So the siRNA is uh, released fairly rapidly uh, compared to the doxorubicin, which is released over longer time frames. All right, so this gives you an example of the results that we see. And uh, maybe it's easier just to start on the right-hand side. Um, we're looking at these mice that have tumors implanted uh, pre-treatment. And then we give them a treatment, and after 15 days, we measure this, how much the tumors increased or shrank in size. And as you can see, when we have doxorubicin combined with the siRNA, we see significant tumor shrinkage, and in some of the mice, the tumors go away altogether. When we look at doxorubicin 
combined with an siRNA that encodes for nothing as a control, we see that the tumors increase in size. Uh, doxorubicin is helping, but not very much. And with just the control, we see this increase in size. Here you can see the quantitative version of this data in which um, you see the regular growth of the tumor here, unstopped, the uh, doxorubicin, which helps but does not stop the tumor, and then this tumor regression that we can get with the combination system. All right, so we're running short on time. I'll just give you a few short examples and conclude, but this is the general theme of what we're doing. Targeting is something that we can introduce into these nanoparticles by varying not only things like hydroduronic acid, but also by introducing some sort of intentional molecule that binds to the receptor. So we looked at treating osteosarcoma in this fashion by using this bisphosphonate molecule that essentially binds to um, the hydroxyapatite deposits that are produced by osteosarcomas. So I'll make the story short. Um, we can tell vein inject uh, and we're using osteosarcoma tumors that are, uh, again, on the flanks of mice, and we see accumulation over a very long time period in these osteosarcomas. And uh, we can also do in vitro experiments and find that when we bind, when we generate these liposome nanoparticles that are coated with layer-by-layer -layer film, um, we can get very specific uptake in cell death in osteosarcoma cells, and here a low reading means no cells, no living cells, uh, compared to healthy cells which tend uh, not to engage these nanoparticles very much at all. And finally, we can look at the impact on tumor growth, and you can see this a little better in the bottom part of the screen. You can see the untargeted doxorubicin. So we're treating them with a chemotherapy drug in a nanoparticle, but these are very rapidly growing tumors, and they essentially win. They're growing even though we are targeting them, targeting them with the drug. And we can compare this to the targeted system, and we see very little uh, tumor growth, and in some cases we can see uh, some tumor regression. So this is uh, the final example. And this example is the simplest one. Uh, it, just more of an example of collaboration across fields. This is uh, Michael Yaffe again, who's a biologist. And uh, he had actually published this very exciting paper uh, in Cell in which he found that when you try and inhibit one of these um, receptors that enables tumor growth, uh, this is called the EGF, the epidermal growth factor receptor. He actually uses a drug for this. Um, he can actually inhibit it uh, in the presence of doxorubicin and see very little impact of combining them. So here you can see doxorubicin combined with this other drug, or lotinib, it doesn't give you very much bang for your buck in terms of killing these tumor cells. However, he found that if he waited, and instead of delivering them both at once, he allowed several hours to pass, cell death increased by, orders, by huge amounts. So you can see here that if you wait eight hours or 24 hours, you can get a huge difference in the number of cells that die. Um, Michael did a beautiful study in which he talked about the system's biology. There are all these beautiful maps of genetic pathways and blocking things here and not blocking them there, and I won't go into that because I'm not a systems biologist. However, what it does show is that you can actually use sequence as well as just combination of drugs to get a greatly improved effect. And here, what we did was do a combination therapy in which we release uh, the, uh, in this case, or lotinib drug from the outer layers of our vesicle and uh, release doxorubicin from the inside. And we found that we could actually replicate something like his in vitro dosing mechanism in which we have most of the erlotinib being released in the first 20 hours and then we get a bit of a pause in that 20 hour period in the release of, Erla of the uh, doxorubicin before it really begins to come out over the next uh, uh, 20 to uh, 48 hour period. We found that we could replicate a number of the behaviors that he saw in vitro um, with our systems by doing these combinations in different ways. So PLGA with just doxorubicin versus the combination versus our uh, combined system, which gave us a much higher amount of cell death. There's a marker 
what biologists use to indicate whether or not that pathway has changed. Uh, and the marker in this case was caspase-8, a protein that indicates one particular kind of cell death that's enabled when you have the sequence. And we found that we could replicate uh, that marker is present in our combination system. So then we took triple negative breast cancer tumors and with a single injection looked at the efficacy of our doxorubicin-containing liposome and our combination liposome, which gives us sequential delivery. And we found a very significant difference. So if you look over time, 54 hours out to 32 days, with just the single systemic dose, we're seeing a huge difference in the regression of the tumor uh, versus its growth in these systems. So we're very excited about this development. And because it's a relatively simple system, uh, we're beginning to look at how we can translate this to the next level. So I'm going to uh, stop here and conclude. Uh, we talked about self-assembly and how we can build these beautiful nanostructures and actually control their structure using chemistry and using physical chemistry and electrostatics uh, to generate uh, systems that can give us controlled stage release simply by tuning the chemistry and the architecture. This is a modular approach which can be used in several different um, applications, including cancer. And uh, I think that there are different modes of synthesis that we can introduce. A number of the things that, uh, that you guys are working on uh, can provide modes of release that are yet different again and can improve our ability to target systems. So I'd like to thank uh, and acknowledge my group members. I presented the work of Jian Poon and Stephen Morton, Eric, Mohi, and Jason. Um, and I'd like to thank my collaborators. I talked about the collaboration with Michael Yaffe, but we also have strong collaborations with Ronnie uh, Drapkin at Dana-Farber and Michael Beer. These are both for ovarian cancer. And we actually have developed a very rapid way of making these nanoparticles, something we call print and spray. If anyone is curious, you can ask me about later with Jody Simone so that we can rapidly assemble these systems. I'd like to thank my funding, in particular the OCRP Teal Innovator um, Award and, the, um, and Janssen Pharmaceuticals who funded parts of the work that I talked about today. And I'd like to welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience. So Paula, that was a beautiful talk, and I really like this idea of trying to leverage the Warburg effect for tumor targeting. As I understand it, the hypoxic regions are poorly vascularized. Do you think there's some transport limits to get the nanoparticles from the blood vessel to the tumor? Yes, I think that's a real concern. Uh, the question is, as these tumors grow, um, the fact that they're hypoxic means they're getting bigger. And at some point, there's going to be a limit. Um, you're not going to be able to access parts of the tumor tissue without the blood vessels to actually carry the nanoparticle through. So this is something we thought about. In medium-sized tumors, we believe we can get through. But as they get larger, um, we may need to design into these nanoparticles ways in which we can permeate um, the matrix of these uh, tumors. So the number of people have generated uh, tumor penetrating peptides and a range of other systems with varying extents of success. I think it's something that uh, people are still trying to develop now. We do think that colloidal systems have an advantage here. So when we're looking at the liposomal material systems, um, we, for various reasons, will see greater penetration in tumors than when we're working with our more solid systems. And it could be because of the ability for deformation. Size also counts. So as we move to systems that in which we want to treat um, clinically, we're looking at how small, how low can we go, how small can we make these nanoparticles because that will also further penetration. However, one thing to, that's important to point out is that for a number of these treatments, the hope is that you would be treating the patient after a surgery in which a larger mass of tumor is removed. Um, here we're concerned about margins which may still um, have some of this hypoxic character and we're concerned about METs which uh, will also be something that are, is difficult for the surgeon to remove. But it's important to remember when we talk about nanomedicine that we're not always talking about the injection being the only mode of um, 
of treatment. Uh, typically, the surgeon is going to look for what can be removed, and we go in with the chemotherapy to clean up, to try and, and eliminate any reside, re residual tumor cells, and it becomes much more relevant if you get recurrent tumors or metastatic disease. <laughs> and walk it around. All right, thank you. Thanks for a great talk. I had a question, which is, um, were you surprised by the hyaluronic acid um, blood circulation times? I wouldn't have that be a go-to for a stealth-like coating. Yes. And if you mm -hmm. don't think it's stealth, you know, is albumin or some other protein effectively making it that? That's a great question. Um, we were surprised that hyaluronic acid would be different from, that we looked at a set of maybe five or six charged polysaccharides, thinking let's use something native that will get us through FDA. And uh, negative charge we knew would help us, um, but uh, we didn't anticipate that we'd see a difference. However, what we found is uh, we've also looked at uh, polyacrylic acid, which is, you know, synthetic and uh, and it does, although it doesn't give us the targeting uh, and it doesn't give us the transition that we talked about that gives us enhanced uptake, it does give us decent half-lives. So it could be simply that we have a very densely charged brushy layer. On top of that, there may be some degree of self-recognition. And this is something that's a little bit more difficult to, to measure in vitro, but there may be some self-recognition in solution of these systems. The hyaluronic acid in these absorbed layers is, uh, if you can imagine, a rather loopy um, uh, arrangement. So these are fairly free to move about. And when monocytes see this, they may simply not recognize them. I do think opsonization is lower for these dense negatively charged systems. So other proteins adsorbing onto these systems, I think, um, is something we see less of. Um, we've begun to look at serum stability, and these seem to be fairly serum stable. Um, so albumin, which also has a net negative charge, may not really engage well with these nanoparticle systems. This is a great question, actually. Hi, my name is Yu Ting. I'm a PhD student in biomedical engineering. Uh, it's really exciting. And my question is that your layer by layer system, it introduced a lot of new things. And most of the things that traditional pharmaceutical companies may not have seen all together at once, is that become an issue to translate into clinical settings? Will they prefer let's do one at a time instead of having all four layers together? That's a great question. First of all, any time you look at a combination therapy, you have more of, a, a, more of a, an issue with the FDA. It doesn't mean that it's impossible, but it means that you will need to have larger treatment groups. You're going to need to show differences in the efficacy between the singular drugs and the combination, and uh, that requires a large number of control groups. Not all drug companies want to um, invest on that level because it's a huge investment uh, to do a trial large enough to test those things. That said, a number of them who see the opportunity are interested, and they've become very interested in combination therapies uh, for cancer in the last, uh, I'd say, seven to eight years or, or more. And part of the reason for that is the recognition of these multiple pathways and the diversity of, of cancer. Um, so synergism is something that has become of much greater interest um, of late. One of the things I think is going to be an interesting challenge is introducing sRNA. Already it's of interest and there are a few companies uh, that are in the beginning stages of introducing sRNA. Um, it's already been used, being used for treatments in liver, for liver tumors and also for other liver disease. The reason for that, I bet you can guess from looking at our <laughs> blood, our, our bile distributions, nanoparticles go to the liver, so you know you can get it there. However, getting it to other parts of the body is still a big challenge, and I think uh, companies would invest a lot in translating any of these therapies if you can decrease the accumulation in other parts of the body. So hopefully that answers your question. The, there is one thing um, uh, with regard to translation that uh, is important to mention, and that's, you know, I mentioned the material systems that we use. Those have a greater impact, I think, than the combinations of drugs. 
Um, if you're working with two already approved drugs, there's more comfort. Um, if you're working with a polymer system and it's a polymer that hasn't been tried before, there's less comfort. So when we originally started this work, we, we do a lot of work with our, our own synthetic polymeric materials. Um, but we find that there's the layer by layer work is moving more quickly in that translational, in those translational conversations because we're saying you know, hyaluronic acid and chitosan and dextran sulfate, all very familiar. So those things do help, they make a difference. Yeah, so my question's a pretty simple one. Okay, you're heading to the liver, is that because this is venous blood and that's the first major organ you're gonna go to? Why not access another vessel? Arterial blood will move away from the lungs, be more systemic. Heading to the liver, that's one of the, that's, that's gonna be one of the obvious routes when you're looking at venous blood to detoxify the blood. So why not go access a vessel on the other side of the liver? Oh, okay, I see. So, so you're saying is there, there, there's a way to introduce well, the systemic? Ah, I see, I see. I, th I think the, the accumulation of the liver is not, um, if, if we used a different vein, we would still see this accumulation. This is a, a kind of uh, classic for nanoparticle systems. Uh, the filtration organs uh, will accumulate, nanoparticles will accumulate in these filtration organs. It's something, it's a conversation in the nanoparticle field, right? And, and uh, how, do we, how do we lower that? And how important is that? You know, is, it, it, does it depend on the composition of the nanoparticle and what it breaks down into? Um, are these nanoparticles ones that will release there? Or are they simply going to be processed, you know, and excrete? You know, so, so all of these are, are open questions. There's been better imaging tools lately, which allow you, we're, we're looking into some of this now, allow you to track your drug versus the nanoparticle and uh, get a sense over time of what's happening. But right now, the only thing we can do is measure cytotox signals. So, so, so we look at cytokines. Uh, we do these small panels, what we can do in our lab, maybe five or six of them. And we look at whether those are upregulated. And we don't see upregulated in the systems that I described. We've certainly made systems where you do. And they have been, you know, axed. <laughs> but the ones that, that, that we're talking about now, we don't see signals in these mice. But when we start moving to larger animals and you know, some of, the, some of the mice are immune competent and some aren't. You know, you begin to see more of, of, of these um, things that you want to explore. One thing that we are doing for ovarian cancer is, is uh, in, intraperitoneal injection. So IP delivery right into the, the cavity um, greatly decreases the accumulation in the liver and allows nanoparticles to accumulate. So, so for ovarian, which is one of our newer areas, it's extremely promising. Uh, so physicians think that's great, but if we can deliver something that is systemic, it's much easier to treat the patient. You know, and, 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 you know, so the number of times that you treat and how you get there or get in there influences um, the response of the patient to the treatment um, on some level. And IP is a bit more invasive is, is what some surgeons feel. So um, we're still working on the systemic and the IP sort of in parallel to see which ones will pan out. Hi, um, I really enjoyed your talk. Just a couple questions. One, you know, you mentioned geometry of the molecules playing a pretty significant role. One in, you know, the optimization of ligand binding, um, et cetera, et cetera. Can you force the geometry of such molecules? Or does the geometry and these interactions of geometry sort of happen naturally, I guess, like due to energetics? I, what we were examining, I think, was due to energetics, was due to uh, the nature of presentation of the receptor on these particular uh, cell types. And what we understand, we, we did expand the work to other ovarian cancer cell types, uh, that these, these uh, systems can be optimized to different types of tumors. So we don't expect that the overexpression will yield the same result in all, of, all different ligand uh, receptor types and may be meaningless in certain ligand systems and very meaningful in others. So I think there's a lot more to explore there. But everything, all that we're doing is, um, is manipulating the presentation on our nanoparticle system to see if that allows us to essentially 
get into a thermodynamic um, pocket, if you want to think of it that way, that is, uh, it greatly enhances binding. And for certain receptor types, that is uh, a feasible thing. Um, and I imagine for others that it would be quite different. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah no, I just, uh, I wanted to learn a little bit more about that. I guess my second question is, I've done a little work with like silk nanoparticles. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, silk is such a, is it's a, I guess, prized material because it's not just like, you know, biocompatible, but because it's extremely strong, it's resistant, so versatile in form. Have you considered like, util you know, utilizing other materials besides the ones you mentioned? Because if you could combine like biomaterials that are so organic and yet so versatile in nature with this layer by layer assembly, you've, I think you pretty much hit, you know, like jackpot uh, in creating any sort of, I guess, molecule customizable to any sort of targeting need. Um, is that maybe where the research will go in the future, or is there some more time needed to con consider combining those two ideas? Actually, I don't think uh, that uh, that's actually an, a great idea. We have not looked at silk as a nanoparticle core, but the approach that we use is very modular. So uh, if, we, if one generates silk nanoparticles and you can generate them so that they have some sort of native charge, then we can layer on them something like siRNA. So it is quite doable. We've looked at other kinds of nanoparticle cores, and uh, in each case, we've been able to translate them. Um, PLGA and liposomes are the, are the favorites right now because they're both um, already in clinic. But in terms of modularity, we, we can actually explore a range of different materials. Silk is a great one. Um, there are a few other biomaterials that may be interesting for nanoparticles as well. Yeah. Hi. Um. You said that the nanoparticle is between the size of an antibody and a virus. How would the immune system not detect it and see it as a threat? That's a wonderful question. Very smart. So essentially, uh, these systems, if I didn't put anything on them, would be recognized by monocytes. And to some extent, all of these nanoparticle systems to some fraction of them are recognized by monocytes and what they call the MPS system, uh, you know, monocyte phagocytic system will get rid of those nanoparticles. So we're really talking about a game of efficiency. And uh, what we're doing is taking these nanoparticles, if, if we, they're naked and we introduce them in the bloodstream, they will immediately absorb serum proteins. Uh, they'll immediately be recognized by monocytes and they will be cleared. And uh, we, we have a few examples where you inject the quantum dot and it, you know, comes out a few hours later. However, if you're able to introduce something that prevents recognition, then you can stay for a little bit longer. Eventually, you're going to get caught. <laughs> Eventually, you're going to, you're, you, but, but if you can get some fraction of your nanoparticles from that injection to reside long enough to accumulate in the tumor, you can deliver your, your cargo. So what we're using in this hyaluronic acid layer, the idea is where, where what we think is happening now is that we have a huge amount of water bound to the hyaluronic acid groups. And, and uh, these, this is a very hydrated molecule. It's negatively charged, which lowers its interactions with a number of negatively charged proteins and with plasma membranes that they might encounter. And uh, we don't know yet, but there could also be some impact of mechanical property. That's something we have not had the opportunity to study yet, but um, the mechanics, there's a, there's a mechanical interaction that also influences binding and, and uptake. So all of these things put together, we think, allow us to get the nanoparticle to survive longer and get through the bloodstream long enough for a fraction of them to have an impact. Okay, this is going to have to be our last question. We're almost out of time. Hi, my name is David. I'm with a PhD in the chemistry department. My question is, what do you think about applying this kind of technology to target uh, resistant bacteria? Ah. Where you can knock down a resistant gene, but also use some type of compound to target the bacteria? I think it's interesting. Uh, one of the interesting things about bacteria is that uh, typically you're, you're dealing with a biofilm if you, if you are working with an implant or, or something along those lines. So I think this is something that would be interesting in that arena. Uh, we have begun to look at targeting infectious disease by um, incorporating antibiotics uh, and looking at a flu model uh, of a mouse. This is a collaboration with uh, 
Bevan Ingleward, who knows a, a lot more than we do about infectious disease at MIT. Um, so we've been working with her, and I think with, with some interesting but mixed results. Uh, one of the things we're finding is that because the nanoparticle is so good at encapsulating our molecule, it's, it doesn't release it with the speed that you need to get uh, to bacteria and actually induce bacterial cell death. So it's actually something of a sluggish guy because it's encapsulated. So I think if one were to adapt this approach, you would want to look at a system that would undergo rapid release on contact with bacteria. And if you're targeting uh, anything that may involve a biofilm, you also need to find something that can penetrate uh, the biofilm. And that may mean manipulating the surfaces of the nanoparticle so that it can actually diffuse through and get some sort of transport or perhaps uh, even uh, transcytosis in, in, in those biofilm systems. But I think it's an interesting idea. We uh, clearly, we think it's interesting uh, because we tried these early experiments, but I think uh, what, what it told us was there's a lot of synthetic design to improve the system and get it where it needs to be. So that might maybe you know, the torch your, you or your colleagues will carry on. Okay, Paula, thank you so much. That was wonderful.